Good morning. I am so glad you decided to join us this morning. We have been doing church this way now for two months. I enjoy the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus in this way, but I do indeed miss the interaction of people. I'm here in the sanctuary all by myself, and it's a challenge to do my best to communicate to you what's most important to me as a follower of Jesus. My prayer is that when this isolation crisis is over or has settled down, you would find yourself involved in the life of a local church, interact, see that the ministry of that church is outgoing and effective. And if you haven't been a part of this church family before all of this happened, I hope that you'll continue to join us as we will be broadcasting live each Sunday morning. But now we're here, and I'm glad we're able to be together at this time. I'm so glad that we can rely on the Word of God. Think of all that's going on in the world today. We get this report that says one thing. We hear another thing that says something totally different. One political party says one thing. Another political party says something totally different. I mean, look at the weather. It snows one day and is 70 degrees the next. There's so many differences. I am so glad that the love of God, that the, lo that the love that God has for each of us doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I ask you to keep that thought as we spend the morning together. This morning, we're beginning a new series called, Where Is It Found? And for the next three weeks, we're gonna be talking about phrases that people say and believe that are in the Bible, but are not. Once again, it's important to know your Bible. This morning, the phrase that we're going to be discussing is, God helps those who help themselves. Let me draw your attention to two things on our church webpage. The web address, by the way, is generstownumc.org. And at the bottom of the page, there's a big banner that says Grace Ministries. Right under that banner is a note that says, click here to access Grace Ministries programs. And once you do that. Once you click on that on that link, you will need to enter a username and a password. So grab a piece of paper and a pen and I'm going to give you the name and the password that you need to get into this fantastic resource. It's free to everyone who gets on. There are 20 different studies and 11 biographical movies called the Heroes Collection. So here's the username. It's Jennerstown UMC but it's capital J in Jennerstown and then capital U, capital M, capital C, Jennerstown UMC. It is case sensitive, so make sure you capitalize the J and the U and the M and the C. The password is the word grace. It is not capitalized. So once again, Jennerstown UMC, capital J for Jennerstown and then capital U, capital M, capital C. And then the password is grace, G-R-A-C-E, it is not capitalized. There are some great learning opportunities for you there. There's stuff for men, there's stuff for women. Uh, there are areas to strengthen your spiritual walk. So please check it out. Next week, I'll highlight something that's on that page. The second item on our webpage is the donate button. And I wanna encourage you to consider giving to the church if you do not do so already. You know, giving is an act of worship, just as much as reading the Bible and praying. It's not a plea to, 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 to get your money. I simply want you to know that giving is an act of worship <clears throat> and God blesses us when we honor him by giving. We have a, a very active prayer ministry in this church. And if you have any areas where you'd like for us to be praying about, please let us know either by calling the church office or emailing us. In a little bit, we're gonna be praying as well. It says in the letter of James in the New Testament that the, the fervent and effectual prayers of a righteous person avails much. I want to encourage you to pray fervently. Pray hard. Pray deeply. Not just a quickie so we can get on to other things, but let prayer be something that resonates inside you all day. And let that eagerness begin this morning as we pray together. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, it is good that we can pray at any time, knowing that you hear us and that you love us. We, we ask that our prayers would be deep prayers, that we would, we would so mean what we ask for and what we give you thanks for, that we would not simply be saying words, 
but that we would realize the opportunity and the privilege that we have to be talking with you. We thank you that you hear us. We thank you that you answer prayer, but you always answer prayer in the best way. We ask that you would you would bless us. We ask that you would keep us safe. Help us to be wise in these days. We also ask that you would help us to be good witnesses, that we represent you when we are out about, even when we are in our with our families. We ask that you would bless us and help us to be a blessing to other people. As we open your word today, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us in a very real way, that we would grow closer to you, and we give you thanks for this time that we have. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I I enjoy the, the short time to talk to the kids. We, we have a, a fire whistle, a siren. It's really in our front yard. It is loud. Uh, it's not the first time we've ever had a siren close by. If we're outside and the, and the whistle goes off, we need to go inside because it hurts our ears. I remember when I was growing up, I was part of an ambulance corps that my dad started. And I wasn't old enough to drive the ambulance, so I would sit in the back while the siren blew and we could get to where we needed to go fast. And we had stretchers for people to be on when we went to go help them. And, and, uh, and that's what we did as an ambulance corps. But the fire trucks were different. Now, we both had sirens, but they had ladders. They had hoses. You know, the ladders, they, they cranked up to rescue people in burning buildings. I was able to help them once they got on the ground, but never had the ladders. Now, I want you to think about that ladder with me. Think about lifting up. The ladder with the fire truck rescued people. As followers of Jesus, we're called to lift people up in prayer. That's another way of saying that we are praying for a person. How can we lift someone up in prayer? Maybe we know somebody's having surgery. Maybe somebody's sad. Maybe someone lost their job. Maybe somebody doesn't have enough to eat. And so we lift them up to God in prayer. Now, it doesn't have to be a sad thing that we pray about. We can pray prayers of what's called thanksgiving. We are thankful for the new baby that was born, or we're thankful, we're thankful that we have things to eat. We're thankful that someone could graduate. We're thankful for the place where we live or the clothes that we have. We can always be thankful that we know that Jesus loves us. So, lifting up people in prayer is a really great thing. And I want to encourage you to lift people up this week. Pray for them, because that's what God wants us to do. Now, those of you who are older, if you were to ask people what might be in the Bible, you'll get all kinds of answers. If you ask the average person, what was the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve ate? What do you think the most common answer would be? Most people would say, apple. But actually, the Bible doesn't say that. It just says fruit. Ask people how many wise men there were. Top answer, three. Again, the Bible doesn't say. It does talk about the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't know how many wise men there were. What book of the Bible is that found in? It's not. Here's another one. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Not in the Bible. Gallup had a poll where a whole bunch of people thought that the epistles were the wives of the apostles. Some people thought that Jesus' most famous talk was called the Sermon on the Mount because it was delivered on horseback. Some people thought Noah was married to Joan of Ark. Once again, not in the Bible. So we're doing a series called, Where Is It Found? And it's about sayings or thoughts that get attributed to God but are not actually in the Bible. And God did not actually say. The reason for the series is that often it's our wrong ideas about God and his will and character and the way that he works that creates stumbling blocks for our ability to trust him and to love him. A lot of people think the Bible says that God will never give you more than you can handle. 
So they think being a Christian means your life will always be manageable. But the Bible never says that. And life will often give people things they can't handle at all. A lot of people think the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. So they think that the Bible is anti-money. Or, or they think if you have financial gifts or the ability to generate wealth, you're not really a deeply spiritual person. But that's not what the Bible says about money. So in this series, we're going to get to know God better so that our faith in him can get stronger and our love for him can grow deeper and we'll begin to obey him more naturally and more joyfully. The statement we're looking at this morning is maybe the erroneous quote most often attributed to God. And it's this, God helps those who help themselves. Now this saying, God helps those who help themselves, actually goes back to one of Aesop's fables. In this fable, a, a man is driving a wagon and it gets stuck in the mud and he gets out and kneels down and prays to the gods to unstuck it. Hercules appears to him and tells him to get off his knees and put his shoulder to the wheel. And Aesop says that the moral is the gods help those who help themselves. It is not in the Bible. Now, it's certainly true God doesn't call us to be passive. God has given to each of us a mind and a body and a will, and he wants us to take initiative, and he wants us to take responsibility. That's a good thing. Faith in God doesn't mean I get a free pass from having to study for tests. Faith in God doesn't mean I don't have to exercise in order to be healthy. Faith in God doesn't mean I don't have to show up for work on time with a good attitude. God will generally not do for you what he enables you to do for yourself. But, but, our biggest problems in life are in precisely those areas where we cannot help ourselves. And then we find we have this strange resistance to asking for help. Asking for help, it, it offends my pride. Asking for help makes me feel small and, and, and incompetent. A great danger, and we've all been there, is if we don't get help, what started out as a problem will turn into a crisis. What started out as going over budget ends up in debt or shame. What, what started out as a pattern of unresolved conflict ends up in divorce. What, what started out as a bad habit becomes an addiction. What started out as a problem with, being, with flirting turns into an affair. A problem with procrastination turns into unemployment. A problem with sarcasm turns into a life where people don't want to be my friend. So here's the truth about me. I need help. It's a deep truth. I'll tell you a little secret about you. You need help. And the next person you see today, and maybe they're right next to you in the car, or they're sitting next to you on the computer or on a couch, you can say to that person, you need help. Amazingly enough, from a human perspective, the whole story of the people of God and their great adventure together begins with a single word, help. Now we're told about, told, told about this uh, when the Israelites were oppressed in slavery in Egypt. It says the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. God did not say, hey, get organized. Hey, show some initiative. Hey, put your shoulder to the wheel. I'll help people who help themselves. God just helped. Now, who does God help? Well, God helps people who ask for help. God helps people who are needy. God helps people who are weak. God helps people who are scared. God helps people who are way in over their heads. God helps people who can't help themselves. Now, to be clear, God helps other people too. God loves to help so much that sometimes he shows up and gives help for no reason at all. Jesus said that one of the signature characteristics of his father is that he makes the sun to shine on both good people and bad people. He sends the rain to fall on both the just and the unjust. And one of the favorite words in the Bible to describe God is help. 
even our hymns. Here's, here's one of the hymns. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Mostly being the kind of person God will help means being a person who's willing to pray or is actually devoted to prayer. God helps those who pray because those who pray are asking for help and looking for help and hoping for help. And what we're really called to in the Bible on this issue, rather than self-help, in other words, God helps those who help themselves, we're called to prayer, a life of prayer and an attitude of prayer. I don't know where you are on the prayer deal. Maybe you've been disappointed by prayer. You cried out to God for something that really mattered to you and nothing happened. Or, or maybe you feel guilty about prayer. A lot of people put prayer in this category as one of those things I know I ought to do more of, but I don't do enough of it and don't seem to find the time and I just feel guilty. And then I kind of avoid it and it gets worse. Or, or maybe you're confused about prayer. You hear other people tell stories about amazing answers to prayer or feeling deep intimacy with God. But when you pray, your mind starts to wander and pretty soon you're thinking about grocery shopping or an old TV show. And maybe if you're really honest about it, and this is a good time to be honest, you don't believe in prayer. Maybe the idea of talking to an invisible supernatural being doesn't make sense to you. Or you think prayer doesn't really change anything and God knows, knows what he's going to do already. And maybe prayer is that way. But maybe, but maybe prayer is the great joy of your heart. Maybe you've known secret moments of peace in times of trouble. Maybe you've known times of courage in situations that normally would produce great fear. Maybe you have found strength and control in situations where normally you would have made terrible choices and you can't even put into words your gratitude for those moments of prayer. So wherever you are in this prayer thing, there's a story in the Old Testament of one of the first times that God taught his people about the power of prayer. So I want to look at that this morning. God had delivered Israel from the Egyptians after they first cried out for help. They're in the desert. They're on their way to the promised land. And they were told quite out of the blue that they were attacked by a group of people called the Amalekites. Their whole existence, their calling, not just as a nation, but as a people who were blessed in order to be a blessing to the whole world. They, they had a mission. All of this is threatened. And they don't know why. And Moses calls his number two man, Joshua, in for a strategy session. Now, we're told Moses was the one man in all of Israel who had been raised in Pharaoh's courts. And that means probably he would have had military training. He would have been schooled in military strategy. So Joshua would wait for some great battle plan, but we're not told of anything like this. So Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. And tomorrow I'll stand on, on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Now, we're not told what Joshua thought of this plan. If I were Joshua and I went to a strategy session like that, I would, I would have expected a little more strategy. I might have expected that our leader Moses would be right down there with us in the middle of the battle. But he has another plan. The morning comes and Moses climbs up this hill. And he goes there with his brother and another man named Hur, H-U-R, her was the son of a leader called Caleb. And it's thought that the name her means liberty, which would be very relevant to the story of liberated slaves. But when I read this, his name sounds to me something like out of an Abbott and Costello who's on first routine. I mean, it's like this, uh, Aaron, get her to come with me. You want her? I thought you wanted him. I, I do want him. Who's him? I just told you, her, get her. Anyways, I digress. Moses needs Aaron and her for an important reason. Moses goes up on the mountain and he raises his arms toward heaven and towards God. Now, it's quite amazing. The text doesn't tell us a single word he prayed. In fact, the text doesn't even have the word prayer in it. 
Remember, there's no books about prayer written back in those days. The first books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, and so on, they weren't even written yet. And maybe Moses, like a lot of people, felt reluctant to pray in public out loud. Earlier, Moses had said that he was slow of speech, he was slow of tongue. So maybe no audible words came out of him. Maybe, maybe Moses felt awkward or silly or useless with all these men fighting. But prayer is not about coming up with impressive sounding words. It's, it's about the heart. It's primarily about the one that we pray to. What we pray matters much less than who we pray to. This is a single act of the will expressed by his body. Help. And the most amazing thing happened. Help came. Power came. Power from God. Power for the battle on earth. It was like a it was like an electric current flowed into him and, and through him and beyond him. And, and the men fight like men inspired. They can't be stopped. They can't be defeated. A bunch of ex-slaves. It's amazing. But then Moses grows weary and his arms are tired. And he can't keep holding them up. And But when they come down, something happens to the spirit of the soldiers on the field and they begin to lose the battle. And so Moses raises his hands back up and, and the tide turns yet again. Israel begins to prevail. And, and it dawns on Moses and maybe on Aaron and Hur that, that Joshua, when Moses reaches up to the heavens in prayer, power is released. And the battle is no longer merely a matter of flesh and blood. There's another power. There's another force. There, there's another kingdom at work. There's a an unseen reality in the battle. God is giving his people a physical picture of a much deeper spiritual reality. And that is we are not made to live on our own power. We're made to live in dependence on God. And over time, this discovery gets deepened and elaborated over and over and over in the Bible, supremely through Jesus. And then it spreads to people and it still goes on today. For instance, there's an alcoholic named Bill who lives in stubborn pride year after year after year in his battles with the bottle and the enemy is killing him. And finally he hits bottom and he realizes he's hopeless and he, he lifts his arms towards heaven and he prays that single word, help. And the battle for sobriety that he could never win begins to turn as long as he lives one day at a time with hands lifted up saying, God help me. I I, I can't do this. God, help me. And through that surrender comes victory. This is the invitation for you today. In your work, in your home, in your relationship, or in your confusion, or with your diagnosis, or in your loss, or in your fear, there is a battle going on. And everyone that you see is facing a battle. We're we're not meant to do battle alone. Now, what will keep me from asking for help generally is pride and self-sufficiency. By the way, very often God chooses human means to give us divine help. Let me say that again. Very often God chooses human means to give us divine help. And there are, I think, two great truths that if I can get them, if I can get them embedded in my mind, they'll they'll help me to be more and more able to raise my hands in prayer in a good habit. And I kind of associate them with, with two arms going up. And, and the first great truth is this: God is able. God is able. How able is God? Well, according to the Bible, He is exceedingly able. Able. He is able to speak the universe into being, to say, let there be light, and there's light. He's able to bring the plagues that'll change the heart of a Pharaoh. When the Red Sea needed to be parted for Israel to walk through, God was able to part it. When manna was needed to feed the people, God was able to bring it. When a storm threatened the lives of his disciples, God was able to still it. God was able to rescue Daniel from a lion's den. He's able to deliver three young men from a fiery furnace. He was able to take 
five loaves and two fish and feed a crowd of thousands of people. He was able to make a donkey talk. He was able to make the lame walk, able to make the blind see, able to make a leper clean. He was able to make a dead man live. Paul said this, that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. It's like he loaded us up with one thought after another. God is able to do what we ask. And not just that, but he's able to do all, all that we ask. And not just that, but he's able to do more than all we ask. And, and not just that, but he's able to do more than all we ask or imagine. And not just that, but he's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. How able is God? He is very able. He is exceedingly able, and his arm has not lost any of its strength. God is able, and I have to trust in that, at least enough to turn to him. God is able. So God is able, but also God is willing. God is able. God is willing. God could be a very strong being, but if if he doesn't have a caring heart and a listening heart, I don't want to hold my hands up to heaven all day. God is willing. He's not just able. He's willing to hear. He's willing to notice. He's willing to love. He's willing to act. How willing? Very willing. The, the writers of scripture say that he's willing enough to count the hairs on your head and keep every one of your tears in a bottle. He's willing to hear the groans of his people and the blood that cries out from the ground of every single victim. He's willing to suffer like a, a, a lovesick father waiting for his prodigal child to come home. He's willing enough to become like one of us. That's called the doctrine of incarnation, that in Jesus, God became flesh. And part of what it means is God learned firsthand what it's like to need help. Now, think about this. God learned that. When Jesus was a little boy, he would say this word to Mary, help me, mommy. That's one of the first words a child learns. Help me get dressed. Help me eat my food. It's amazing that God humbled himself in Jesus, the maker of the universe, asking for help to tie the laces of his sandals. If a parent lives long enough now, things change. End up asking their children for help. Help me get dressed. Help me eat my food. We are born needing help and we die needing help. And in between, we can fool ourselves into thinking we don't need help, but all it takes is a little age or a little health problem or a little blood vessel that doesn't work just right or a little email from work saying that the job is no longer ours. And we remember that word, help. In the end, Jesus, that is God in the flesh, could not even carry his cross by himself. And a man named Siren from Cyrene had to carry it for him. The story of Jesus ends as it begins with a God who, who somehow knows what it is to be weak and small and unable and, and, and needing help. That's our God. He's so willing. He has such a generous heart. And he's not frustrated. And he's not impatient. And God is waiting right now. So where do you most need help from God? God, give me strength to face this crisis. God, give me wisdom to know how to parent. God, give me peace in the midst of this storm I'm in. God, give me the ability to overcome my anger and my bitterness. God, take away my fear. It's killing me and I can't make it go away. God, give me your help to be able to cope at work. God, give me your patience to be able to dwell in the midst of this problem. God, I haven't lived in joy for a long, long time. God is able. God is willing. And God helps people who can't help themselves. Now, maybe like Moses, you need help from somebody else. Maybe your arms are getting pretty tired. You know, there have been times when, when I've had to say, I don't even know exactly what to pray about right now. And I feel my heart so downcast. I don't know what to say. And I don't know what to do. 
would you pray for me? Would you stand in that gap for me? And friends have said, yes, I'll do that. Then they're like Aaron. They're like her. And those are sacred moments. And we get to do that for each other. It's an amazing picture this story shows us of, the, of life in the kingdom of God where God hears and he cares. God is able and he's willing and he sends his power. And there's a battle that looks like it's being carried on in human flesh, but the real battle is not down on the field. The real battle is up on the mountain with a man named Moses. But Moses gets too tired. Moses gets too weary. And so he has a couple of friends who come alongside of him and they hold up the hands that don't have the strength to hold up themselves. And somehow in the midst of that weakness and brokenness and, and neediness, power of God gets unleashed that never would through human strength and ego alone. That's us. That's the reality in which we live. That's life in the kingdom of God. And maybe you need to ask somebody, would you be my Aaron? Would you be my her? Would you hold up my hands because they're kind of tired right now? Would you support me in prayer because my heart is breaking right now? Lift those hands toward heaven because God is able and he's willing. So we're going to close our time this morning. And I'd ask that you would pray a very simple prayer of help to God. So let's pray. Father, whatever need we have, whatever hurts we have, whatever concerns we have, whatever it is we feel that we can't do by ourselves, we ask for help. Please give us help. Send alongside someone who would pray for us, who would hold up our hands so that we might know your power and your grace and your peace. We thank you for this time of prayer and this time that we can do that for each other. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have yourself a great week. And pray for someone this week because God gives to us all the help that we need.